Good afternoon, Seaside Shadows, family, friends, and guests. Welcome to another edition of our uh, Saturday Cemetery Tales. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today, I am here in Marlboro, Connecticut at the Marlboro Cemetery to tell you all about someone who I think is one of the most fascinating people that I've ever researched. Uh, you are all going to have to bear with me today. Um, this is New England and Mark Twain said something like, in New England the weather changes every five minutes. If you don't like it, wait five minutes. Hopefully this wind isn't going to be too much of a problem for us today. Um, I'm going to speak as if I'm yelling a lot of the time, uh, mostly because it's very windy. You can see by my hair, you can see by all of these flags waving around as I walk to our destination that it is incredibly windy here today in New England. Thankfully, where I am, there hasn't been too much uh, activity yet, um, but we may even see some snow today. Now, I don't know if you guys can hear that, but that is a lot of wind. <laughs> to, reiter excuse me. to reiterate, we are here in Marlboro, Connecticut, standing in the Marlboro Cemetery. It is not a very large plot of land, but we are here to talk about one of the most fascinating characters that I think I've ever researched in my time as a historian. I was so excited to find out that he lives so close by. It's actually only 10 minutes to my house down that road that you see there. Uh, so it is really, I am so close to this incredible historical figure. But here we are at Thomas Carrier's erroneous grave. Now, I'll get into a little bit about why I call it Thomas Carrier's erroneous grave in a second, but I want you to look at this monument. It is impressive. <laughs> now, Thomas Carrier is a fascinating figure. And I keep bringing that up, but once I get into this tale, you're really going to see why he was so fascinating. And the mystery about him started at a very early age and continued until well into his life. Yes, that's right. This man, no doubt, lived to be at least 103 by all records. Thomas Carrier was a very fascinating figure. Even at a young age, he captured people's attention. He was born a Welshman in anywhere from 1626 to 1630. You will find with Thomas Carrier that nearly every single one of the dates in his life can be disputed, has been disputed, and is mysteriously unknown. Thomas Carrier was a physical specimen. He was so impressive that he stood at, by all records, and this is from both Colchester and Marlboro town records, that he stood at seven foot four. I'm six three. If you took a foot and added it onto my body, I'm about the same size as his stone here. If we took about another foot and added it onto this stone, onto my height, you're looking at about what Thomas Carrier was. He was such a physically imposing specimen that legend has it that he was invited, initiated into King Charles I's King's Guard. He was a very highly reputable warrior, apparently. Now, when he did serve King Charles, this was under a period of great tumult, very uh, political rife times. It is said, even, that Thomas Carrier was the one who carried out the execution 
of King Charles. You see, the, uh, the regular executioner refused to behead the king, knowing that perhaps this act would follow him. Now, there are disputed reports as to whether or not he is actually the person who executed King Charles I. But what's known is that he was at the very least involved. It is thought that it is for this reason that Thomas Morgan, his original birth name, moved to the States. Because eventually, King Charles II, King Charles I's son, would come into power, and he would pardon all but those who had taken part in King Charles I's death. Thomas Morgan would definitely not have been pardoned, especially if there would have been rumors that he himself had held the sword or the axe that had actually executed King Charles. And so, Thomas Carrier would move to the States. And it is said that he arrived at the States somewhere, excuse me, I will grab the information. As, as I said, there are a lot of conflicting dates in Thomas Carrier's life. But it is said that he moved to America somewhere between 1664 and 65. When he moved to America, he moved to Bilrica, Mass. And it is reported that he was a very unsettled person when he moved here and would constantly move back and forth in his early years in America to Bilrica and Andover. It is there in Andover that he meets the love of his life, a very well-known historical figure in these parts, Martha Carrier. Now, if you're not familiar with Martha Carrier, she is one of the most infamous witches that was killed in the Salem Witch Trial. In fact, as I said that, I... that Thomas Carrier had been involved in regicide, in the killing of King Charles I, followed him even to the States. It is said that while in Bilruka, those that lived there found out about his regicide. It is perhaps for that reason that they were banished. There is record of the family being banished in 1676. However, a question remains. Was it because of the regicide, or was it because of the fact that the family had just come down with smallpox? Unfortunately, smallpox was prevalent at the time, but the times being what they were, whispers of witchcraft spread. As smallpox ravaged the Carrier family, two of their children, just born, passed away. As they continued their fight against this disease, Martha took care of the family. It did spread to her extended family, and rumors are that the Carrier family was run out of Bilrica because of smallpox. They landed in Andover, where they ended up settling for quite some time. Martha took care of her family there, and thankfully for them, but perhaps forebodously, unthankfully, none of them died of smallpox. But the community got sick where it hadn't been before. They were thought to have brought smallpox to this small community, and therefore 
the local suspicion that was in Salem began to leak to Andover. And 13 people soon passed away. Oh, it's snowing now. 13 people soon passed away from the smallpox disease. And because of that fervor in Salem, it got into their minds that this was an act of witchcraft. How else could Martha be protecting the Carrier family? So Martha was the first person accused in Andover of witchcraft. She was dragged to Salem and imprisoned, where she refused to come clean, to confess that she was a witch and was practicing in witchcraft. It wouldn't take long for four out of their five remaining children to be imprisoned as well. Thomas was never accused of witchcraft, though his fam- the majority of his family was. Tragically, this tale, unfortunately, has an element of perhaps betrayal to it. It's not known whether it was coercion or torture, but a few of Martha's kids ended up testifying against her. Now, one account from the prison that the children were imprisoned uh, at states that the two boys, Richard and Andrew, were hung by their heels until blood ran from their nose and threatened to run from their eyes. That sounds like very painful torture, and no doubt you could get them to, unfortunately, try to convince the jury that their mother is a witch. Those testimonies, however, were not taken into account by the jury. It was their daughter's testimony, young Sarah, that is said to have, quote-unquote, figuratively put the final nail in the coffin for Martha Carrier. She was one of the witches that was hung in Salem. I cannot say, because I cannot even imagine what Thomas had been feeling during this entire ordeal. The fact that four of his five children were imprisoned. The fact that his wife had just been murdered, accused of practicing witchcraft. He did remain in Andover for a few years later, but found that the community was not welcoming. He would eventually move to what is now Marlboro. And it is said... Excuse me. It was said that the first record of them in Connecticut was in 1701, and he owned all of what was known then as North Westchester, which would later become part of Marlboro. While he was here, he began to undertake a blacksmith study and did eventually own and operate an ironworks along the uh, Salmon River. He fought very hard after his wife's death, and you can see the snow is uh, coming down quite a bit now. He did fought very hard after his wife's death to try and get her name cleared. After all, it was eventually revealed that the hysteria in Salem had been just that, hysteria. And it was on October 17th, 1711, that Thomas was given reparations of seven pounds and six shillings for the hanging of his wife, and her name was posthumously cleared of all charges. Thomas, however, I imagine, would struggle to find peace at this time. 
though he did go on to live quite some time longer, after all of the events, after his children being tortured, after his wife's murder, it would be hard for that to really have closure. And in fact, he vowed that he would never love again after Martha, and never remarried. Now, as to why I called this the erroneous grave of Thomas Carrier, is because it's well known that this was not the original resting place of Thomas Carrier. There was a plot of land on the Carrier homestead itself that they would have been buried at. It is unknown who moved the bodies and why. But there was a thought that construction had been done on the plot of land at some point, and the bodies would have been moved here. But the question still remains, why? And why so many errors on the grave? Thomas Carrier did not die in 1739. He died in 1735. There's a record of it, and even a quote from the... Excuse me. From the New England Journal about his death on June 9th, 1735. It is quoted as saying... His head in his last years was not bald, nor hair gray. Not many days before his death, he traveled on foot six miles to see a sick friend, and the day before he died, he was visiting his neighbors. His mind was alert until he died, when he fell asleep in his chair and never woke up. There are conflicting accounts of whether or not he actually died in his sleep in his chair. But the fact remains that the New England Journal did post that quote in June of 1735. Why then does this grave erroneously state that he died in 1739? It also mistakenly says that he was 109 years old. Now, there can be no doubt, this man lived over a hundred years. The youngest that he could have possibly been at the age of his death was a hundred and three. There are accounts from family members, however, that he lived into the ripe old age of a hundred and thirteen. Now, what the truth is cannot really be said. There are so many mysteries still surrounding Thomas Carrier. Like, is his body buried here? Is it perhaps somewhere on the homestead still, as there were two bodies left behind that were never moved for some reason? Or is he perhaps somewhere in Colchester with the rest of the Thomas, or the Carrier family? It is said and confusing that Andrew is reported or is uh, featured here on this headstone not just once but twice because Andrew Carrier's body is buried in the Colchester Carrier family plot. The mysteries are thick with the Carrier family. Did this seven foot four, hundred something year old man really kill King Charles the first? Was his wife actually a witch? And how would he have not known that the entire time? Excuse me. As I said, the wind is incredible today. It is messing up my papers quite a bit. There's some good news for the Carrier family in the end. In 1999, the Bill Rucka Board of Selectmen unanimously to rescind the 1676 banishment of the Carrier family. Though this happened hundreds of years too late, their spirits perhaps can rest easy knowing that their communities did apologize. 
When Thomas Carrier died, he left behind five children, 39 grandchildren, and 38 great-grandchildren. He was an incredibly interesting and fascinating person. And I have to say that I do hope that we do get to do more investigation into the Carrier family. His son Richard was imprisoned alongside his brother Andrew, and I hope to go and investigate that grave as well and see if we can see anything there. The Carrier family will be a focus of my historical investigations for the foreseeable future, I feel, as a seven foot four Welsh regicidal husband of a witch who lived to at least 103 years old is my idea of a fascinating character. Thank you all so much for joining us today and for learning about Thomas Carrier with me. I do hope to bring you more information about Thomas Carrier in the future. Thank you. And join us tomorrow for our spooky uh, Sunday story time. For Seaside Shadows, I'm Andrew Hill. Thank you.